Matthew for a while after that. And then we'll end in Luke. So we're going to go to several passages. If you know where those are, I want to encourage you to turn through all of them. If not, you can sit back and listen and let God speak to your heart. I want to encourage you right now, just ask God to give you what you need from his word. If we come to church and we'll listen and we'll ask God to speak to us, he will. And so I encourage you as I preach God's word, ask God to give you what you need, what you came for today. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I do pray that you'll use your word. You promised you would. You said it would not return void, but it would accomplish the thing whereto you sent it. And so you know the will and the work you want to accomplish in each heart today. And I pray that you'll do that. We'll give you all the credit and all the glory for it. And I pray now, if there be someone that is lost, uh, hearing this message, that today will be the day of their salvation. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen. Mark chapter 7, the title of the message, I've told you before, I'm not good with titles. So if someone can think of a better title, please tell me afterwards. This is all I could think of because this is really the crux of the message the title is, When You're Desperate for Help. When You're Desperate. I don't know, some people in here I know uh, have been desperate for help, probably most of us. Um, there may be some in here that you've never been to a storm in your life where you were desperate for help yet. But I'll promise you this, if you haven't faced that yet, you will. If you haven't faced that kind of valley where you're desperate, where you just have to have help, you will. So for some of us, we, we know exactly where uh, this lady in this story has been and where she is because we've been there. For others, as you hear this preached, I want to encourage you to file this away because you will need this because it's part of the human existence. It's part of life. Uh, the Bible says man is born unto trouble as the sparks fly upward. That's part of life. Uh, the scripture says that you know Jesus mentioned those who build their lives upon his word. They're like the man who built his house upon a rock. And the rains descended and the floods came and the winds blew and beat upon that house. And listen, the rains, the storms will come even if you're serving God. And especially, actually, if you're serving God. But what happened? The man's house stood because it was founded upon the rock of Jesus' word, his teaching. But then he said, the foolish man, he's like a man who built his house upon the sand, the shifting foundation. And the same storms came, but his Life, his home was destroyed. Why? Because it was not founded upon a rock. So what I'm telling you is this, storms are going to come. Sometimes people feel, well, I'll make a deal with God. I'll go to church and then God, don't give me any trouble in life. You know, God, I'll serve at church and then no trouble for me, okay? That's not how it works. Life has troubles. Life has storms. And so I, I want to help you if you're in this place right now or if you have been or if you will be to the place where you're just desperate for God to intervene. Mark chapter 7, verse 24. The Bible says of Jesus, it says, From thence he arose and went into the borders of Tyre and Sidon and entered into an house and would have no man know it, but he could not be hid. So he went north out of Galilee to the area of Tyre and Sidon and he was trying to get away with his disciples, but he couldn't be hid. Everybody knew where he was. Verse 25 says, For a certain woman whose young daughter had an unclean spirit heard of him and came and fell at his feet. The woman was a Greek, a Syrophoenician by nation, and she besought him that he would cast forth the devil out of her daughter. Now let's go to Matthew chapter 15. We're going to read the same story in Matthew 15. So we call this a parallel passage. It just simply means that it's the same story written in another place. But Matthew 15, notice verse 21, it says, Then Jesus went thence and departed into the coasts of Tyre and Sidon. Now why that matters is because just a few chapters earlier in the book of Mark, a, few, a little time before this happens, Jesus had healed what we call the maniac of Gadara, who became the missionary of Gadara. And when that man's life was radically changed, all the people of the country, they lost some of their income. And so they went to Jesus, and the Bible says in Mark 5, 17, that they began to pray him to ask Jesus to depart out of their coasts. So here he's entering into the coasts where this woman lives. Previously, he departed from the land of Gadara. Here's what I want to say to you. If you don't want Jesus, then he'll go to those who do want him. If you hear the gospel and you will not come to Christ for salvation... You will miss out 
but he will go to those who will listen. Let me say this to the church. Re Revelation 3, he talks about the church in Laodicea. They were a lukewarm church. They were his church, but they were a lukewarm church. He said, behold, I stand at the door and knock. You know what that means? He, what he means is I'm not going to force you to serve me. I'm not going to force you to listen to me. I'm not going to force you to, to uh, give your heart, your life to me. He said, instead, it's your choice. See, these people wanted Jesus to leave, and he did. I, I'm concerned for our nation. Uh, public schools have wanted Jesus to leave. Let's get the Bible out. We couldn't possibly, we, let's not put the Ten Commandments on the wall. We wouldn't possibly want to tell kids, thou shalt not kill. We wouldn't possibly want to tell kids, thou shalt not steal. We wouldn't possibly want to tell kids to honor thy father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise. And listen, when a society rejects Jesus, they pay the consequences. Get out of our coast, Jesus. Okay. And he'll go to those who do want him. That's why he told his disciples, he said, when you go to preach, if you go to a town and they won't receive you, he said, shake off the dust of your feet as a testimony against them. Not maliciously, but just literally saying, I'm moving on to the next person, the next place who will listen. Well, here, Jesus, they had not long before this, asked him to leave their coasts. And so now he comes to the coasts of Tyre and Sidon. And there's a woman here who has a desperate need. But verse 22, it says, behold, a woman of Canaan came out of the same coast and cried unto him, saying, Have mercy on me, O Lord, thou son of David. My daughter is grievously vexed with the devil. Have mercy on me. I want you to see, number one, the placement of her faith. People say, faith is what matters. Okay, that does matter, but really what matters is in whom you place your faith. See, her placement of her faith was in Jesus Christ. Ephesians 2 says, For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. But listen, just because you have faith does not make you saved. Your faith must be placed in the right person. The placement of your faith is what matters. Uh, people who rode the Titanic placed their faith in a ship they said even God couldn't sink and their faith was misplaced. Not long ago, many of us probably followed the events of the Titan submersible that went to see the ruins of the Titanic. They placed their faith in that vehicle and their faith was misplaced. It led to their destruction. There are many people who have faith, but their faith is placed in the wrong place. They have their faith placed in their works. Well, if I come to church and I have faith in that, I, I'll come to church, I'll hear about God, I'll sing about God, then I'll get to heaven. Your faith is placed in the wrong place. Well, if I get water baptized, that'll wash away my sins. I saw again this week, driving down 44 on the Church of Christ sign, two verses that they are promoting that you must be water baptized to be saved. And folks, I'm telling you, their faith is in the wrong place. There are Catholic churches who promote that you must go to Mary as a co-redemptrix. And the way they teach it is that Mary intercedes to Jesus. That Jesus is kind of mad at you. So you have to go to his mother to talk to him. And then he can represent you. Folks, that is false religion. It's false doctrine. And if you believe that, your faith is in the wrong place. If you believe your good works are going to give you a standing with God, your faith is in the wrong place. The Bible says that all our righteousnesses, all the things we think are so good about ourselves, are as filthy rags to God. So it's not faith by itself that saves. It's faith in the right person that saves. Your faith must be in Jesus Christ. Acts 16.31, they asked, what must we do to be saved? He said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. What does it mean to believe on him? It means to put your faith in him, your trust in him, your full reliance. If I ask you, is there anything you can do to lose your salvation? And you say, yes, there is. Then your faith is not in Jesus and Jesus alone. Your faith is in your works. And I'm telling you today, the way of salvation is by placing your faith 100% in Jesus Christ and Him alone. People ask Jesus, what must I do to work the works of God? And He said, believe on Him whom the Father hath sent. Romans 10, 17, it's the verse for our kids' crusade. It's the verse on the bulletin. It's the verse my mom, God used to uh, give her assurance of her salvation. 
My mom was 20 years old. My dad was 20 years old when he was saved in the Air Force. My mom was 20 years old in her bedroom at home, kneeling by her bed, placing her faith and trust in Jesus Christ. But she had heard what some people say, you have to have some experience, you have to feel something. Folks, feeling doesn't make you saved. And she went to the church, I think it was Berlin Baptist, wasn't it? Berlin Baptist, and evangelist was preaching. And at the end, she came forward, and the evangelist said, well, let's look at Romans 10, 13. What does it say? It says, for whosoever, that's anybody, anybody here, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord, well, who's the Lord? Jesus Christ, shall be saved. So it doesn't matter how you feel. Did you call on Jesus? Are you trusting him and him alone? She said, yes, I am. Then what does that make you? It makes you saved. You see, faith alone is not what saves you. It's faith in the right person. John 3.16, the most famous verse in the Bible, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. When it comes to salvation, folks, salvation is very simple. Jesus did the hard part. He suffered on the cross in our place. He paid the debt for our sins. He was buried. He rose again. And salvation is totally a free gift of God. How many of you have given a gift to somebody before? How much did they pay you? Nothing. You paid the full price. God offers you the gift of eternal life. How much do you pay for that? Nothing. He paid the full price. Isn't that good news? That is the gospel. It's not gospel if you add works to it. If we have to earn our salvation or keep ourselves saved, folks, we're all lost because God's standard is so high that if you offend in one point, you're guilty of all. The placement of her faith was right. It was in Jesus. So I want to say very simply before I move on in this message, if you're here today and you are not saved, your, your faith is in something else. You need today to place your faith in Jesus and him alone for your salvation. Number two, I want you to see her plea, her prayer. In verse 22, Behold, a woman of Canaan came out of the same coast and cried unto him, saying, Have mercy on me, O Lord, thou son of David. My daughter is grievously vexed with the devil. Have mercy. You know what mercy is? It's God not giving us the judgment we deserve. She didn't come to Jesus saying, Jesus, I deserve for you to answer my prayer. She came to Jesus saying, please have mercy on me. Hebrews 4.15 says, we have not an high priest, Jesus, which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. He faced every temptation we do, but he never sinned. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. When Daniel prayed to the Lord, he said this. Listen, don't miss this. He said to the Lord, we do not present our supplications, our, our begging, our pleading. We do not present our supplications before thee for our righteousnesses. Why? Because we don't have any. But for thy great mercies. You know what Daniel was saying? God, please answer. Not because we deserve for you to answer, but because you're merciful. That's what he said. Do you know when you approach God in prayer, do not come touting your accomplishments or your character, come asking for mercy. He said, I'm asking you for this because you're merciful. Number three, I want you to see her purpose. What was her purpose? Her daughter's deliverance. She said, have mercy on me, O Lord, thou son of David. My daughter is grievously vexed with the devil. And then number four, this is what I want to focus most of our time on. Listen, salvation, let, let me go back to salvation. You do not have to beg God for salvation. God is sitting there waiting for you to ask him. He's waiting there for you to believe on Christ. It's like one of these life rings. If someone were drowning out in the water and you were there to save those people, you wouldn't go up on the boat and say, now you've got to ask just the right way. You've got to beg me. You wouldn't do that. You, you're ready to help. You're ready to save. Did you know Jesus stands ready to save? He wants you to believe on him. He's begging you. He's paid the price. And all you must do is believe on Christ. He wants you to be saved. So when I'm talking about salvation, salvation is simple for us because Jesus did the hard part. But once you are saved, I'm talking about when you get to a place in your life when you're in a desperate need for help. And you've prayed. But I want you to see, number four, this lady's persistent, persevering, Patient, prideless, prevailing faith. She 
had to have Jesus' help. She, look, she had no answer. She had to have Jesus' help. Have you ever been there? Again, for some of you, you, you may hear this, and, and, and if you're not careful, you're going to let it go in one ear and out the other because you've not faced a deep, dark place in your life where you've just said, God, I've got to have your help or I'm going to die. But some of you have been there. And all of us will be there at some point in this life. I want you to see her persistent, persevering, patient, prideless, prevailing faith. When she first asked Jesus, Have mercy on me, O Lord, thou son of David, my daughter, is grievously vexed with the devil. Verse 23, what did he do first? Don't miss this. He ignored her. He ignored her request. I thought if I go to God, he's going to answer my request. Listen, at first, what does he do? He ignores her. Verse 23, but he answered her not a word. Some people stop praying right there. So I, I did pray about this desperate need, Pastor, and God hasn't answered yet. So I'm done praying. What I'm telling you is you need to keep praying. What I'm telling you is you need to persevere in prayer. There are many reasons perhaps why God would delay an answer for you. Maybe it's to transform your own heart. Maybe it's to build your own faith. There are many reasons God does that, but I just simply want you to notice He ignores her request. Lord, have mercy on me! He didn't answer her word. God, please, I'm praying. Please, I'm desperate for your help. God, give me an answer. Silence. He answered her not a word. But notice next, that didn't deter her. She goes to his disciples and she begins to irritate them. She irritated the disciples. Jesus isn't going to listen. I'm going to go to the disciples. And she goes to them and she begins to beg them. And they get so frustrated. Verse 23, the Bible says, And his disciples came and besought him, Jesus, saying, Send her away, for she crieth after us. Look, you're not answering her. We can't help her. Send her away. Do you see? She's not going to give up until she has an answer. She's not going to stop asking until there's something, there's some help given. She irritated the disciples. You know, sometimes some people stop praying here. You first pray and there's no answer. Then you pray and people say, look, just why don't you quit praying? Look, it's been long enough. Just stop. I mean, God obviously has answered. He doesn't, he doesn't want to answer your prayer. She irritates the disciples. Notice next, Jesus just flat out denies her request now. Verse 24, but he answered and said, I am not sent, but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Now, at first, this may seem cold-hearted. The fact is, the gospel went to the Jew first and also to the Greek. It's for the whole world. But right here, he just flat out denies, you're, you're not of Israel. You have no standing with me. He denies her request. Did that deter her? This is where some people would stop praying. If you know something's God's will, but you, you keep praying and it seems like the answer is no, what should you do? Keep praying. Notice verse 25, and don't miss this part. See, what all of this next part requires is humility. Do you know why sometimes people stop praying? Is because they're filled with pride. Well, I don't, I don't have to have, look, God, if you don't want to answer my prayer, fine then. This is where some people get bitter at God. This is where some people get angry with God. God, you know, you know what I'm going through. You know the storm. You know the valley. Lord, you, you have, you've ignored my prayer. You won't answer. But instead, what does she do? She humbles herself. Verse 25, then came she and worshipped him. He's already ignored her once. She's begged his disciples and they said, get out of here. Jesus send her away. She asked Jesus again. He says, no. You know, some people only worship as long as they get what they want out of God. Lord, I'll come to church as long as you do everything I want you to do. I've got a deal, me and you, God. Make my life happy and healthy and plenty of money and no troubles, and I'll keep coming to church. Lord, you do things how I want you to do them, and I'll be a soul winner. Lord, you do, you do things how I want you to, and I'll serve you. This is where a lot of people bail out. What I want to encourage you to do is continue like this woman did. She'd been told no. She'd been ignored. She'd been, they tried to run her off. She's still worshiping. 
You know what that word worship literally means? It literally means she is on her face before Jesus. In fact, if you look up, this is interesting. If you look up one definition of worship, it literally means she's like a dog licking her master's hand. How many of you have a dog at home? Anybody? How many of you know a dog is man's best friend? Because no matter how bad a day you're having, the dog will love you anyway, right? You can say all kinds of things to your dog, and the dog will wag its tail and lick your hand. <laughs> it literally means she, she's been refused. They're trying to run her off, but she's still worshiping. You know, I think of John, the revelator, who, who had been persecuted and exiled to Patmos. What was he doing on the Lord's day? Was he sitting there bitter at God, angry at God? No, he was in the spirit on the Lord's day. She worshiped, and notice she pleaded with him again. Then came she. She's humble. She's falling before God. She's basically saying, God, if you don't help me, I won't be helped. Jesus, if you don't intervene, there's no hope for me. Verse 25, then came she and worshiped him, saying, Lord, help me. Now again, for some, this is where he'd stop praying. But verse 26, I want you to notice this. Not only has he ignored her, she's irritated the disciples. Jesus denies her. She's still worshiping and praying, but Jesus now tests her faith. Do you know God will do that sometimes? Many times he'll test your faith. He won't give you the answer you want right away, and sometimes he never will. Now to some, this won't even seem like a test of faith. This will seem like an insult. He tests how bad she wants this answer. Verse 26, but he, when she worshipped him at his feet, saying, Lord, help me, what did he say? But he answered and said, it is not meet to take the children's bread and to cast it to dogs. Now look, if you're full of pride and you're that woman, that's an insult. But if you're humble before God, you know what you do? You just keep pleading and keep pleading. And keep pleading. Some people, when God tests their faith, they get in God's face. Instead of staying at his feet, humble, saying, God, please intervene in my life, they get in God's face. And they demand things from God. God, you do it this way. You do it in my timing, God. And if you don't, I'm out of here. Not her. She was humble. She's pleading. See, Jesus tested her faith. Again, if she were filled with pride, this would be an insult. He said, it's not me. I can't take the bread for the children of Israel and cast it to you. You're a Gentile dog. She didn't get up and leave angry and insulted and said she humbly persisted in prayer. Listen to what James 4, 6 says. It says, he giveth more grace. Wherefore he saith, God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace unto the humble. James 5 says, confess your faults one to another and pray one for another that ye may be healed. The effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. 1 Thessalonians 5.17 says, pray without, what's the next word? Ceasing, without stopping. If God tells you no, are you going to quit on him? If God doesn't do things exactly how you demand he does them, are you going to walk out on him? Pray without ceasing. Matthew 7 says, ask and it shall be given you. Seek and you shall find. Knock and it shall be opened unto you. You know what that means? It means keep asking and keep asking and keep asking and keep asking and keep knocking and keep knocking and keep knocking and keep knocking. And keep, knocking. And keep seeking and keep seeking and keep seeking and keep seeking. But God's ignored me. Keep asking. But God's told me to go away. Keep asking. But I feel insulted because he hasn't answered how I think he should. Keep asking. Stay humble. See, through that humility, God's transforming your life. If in the middle of your trial, your testing, you get proud, God cannot continue to transform your life. We all know the story of Job who had great riches, great blessings. God had put a hedge about him and Satan came and said, actually God said to Satan first, hast thou considered my servant Job? Hey, Satan, I know you love destroying people. How about my servant Job? He loves you. He, he, he loves me. He is faithful. What did Satan say? He said, yeah, because you've put a hedge about everything he has. Touch what he has. 
he'll curse you to your face. God allowed Satan to take everything Job had, including his children. And he still wouldn't curse God. And then Satan came back for God, and God said, See, Satan, hast thou considered my servant Job? He said, Yea, all that a man hath will he give for his life. Let me touch his flesh. He'll curse you to your face. And so the Bible says Job was smitten with sore boils from the top of his head to the bottom of his feet, just horrible, painful sores. And don't be too hard on Job's wife because she's suffering through all of this with him. But she comes to Job and says, Dost thou still retain thine integrity? Curse God and die. And what did Job say? Thou speakest as one of the foolish women speaketh. What shall we receive good at the hand of God? And shall we not receive evil? In all this did not Job sin with his lips. What about when God tells you no? God, I want you to do this. Do this, please. Answer my prayer. And God just flat out says no. I think of Paul, 2 Corinthians 12, 7 through 10. He asked God for, to remove his thorn in the flesh. I think it was a disease of his eyes. Remove this. God, please answer my prayer. What did God tell Paul? Three times. What did he tell him? What did he tell him? No. Did Paul say, that's it, God, I'm out of here. God, I'll only serve you as long as you do things the way I say. Wait a minute, who's God? Is he the genie we tell him what to do, or is he God? And we serve him. What did Job say? Though he slay me, yet will I trust in him. Paul, when he realized God was saying no, he said, Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. What did God tell Paul when he told him no? He said, my strength, my grace is sufficient for thee. For my strength is made perfect in weakness. Hey, if God tells you no, did you know his grace is sufficient for you? You know what we need? We need a revival of Christians who aren't going to just serve God when the bills are paid, when the health is good, when everything's easy. We need a revival of Christians who will say, though he slay me, yet will I trust in him. We need a revival of Christians who will say, when it gets tough, my Savior had it tougher. He went all the way to the cross for me. And if he could go all the way to the cross and suffer in my place, I can take a little persecution. I can take a little trouble in the name of Jesus Christ. We need a revival of that. We've got too much soft soap, easygoing Christianity. I'm going to make a deal with God. God, you make my life easy. I'll show up to church. God, you make my life easy. I might tell somebody about you. I might. I might read my Bible. I might pray. I might give of myself for your cause. No, Jesus said you need to forsake all and follow him. As a matter of fact, he said if you don't forsake all, you can't be his disciple. Do you know he forsook all and went to the cross for us? I remember when we were looking to get this building and the Lord blessed and allowed us to get it. I was around, it was my father-in-law, Brother Addy, who's in heaven. I said, boy, God is good. God is good to answer our prayer and to give us this building. You know what he said? He, it, we call this a spiritual smackdown. All right? You know what a spiritual smackdown is? It's when somebody gives you something really spiritual from the Bible that smacks you. That's a spiritual smackdown. I said, God's so good to give us the answer to this building. He said, God's good even if we didn't get the building. Whack. <laughs> Say, you know what? You're right. God, answer my prayer. God says, okay. Wow, God's good. He's always been good. God, answer my prayer. God says, no. God, you're still good. We need a revival of that. By the way, child of God, let's, let's realize this. Whatever you face here, again, remember what is it? It's temporary. It's temporary. This world's so, so fleeting. Every, the time is so short. We have an eternity with Christ. Our sins are forgiven. We're going to a place where there's no more sorrow, no more pain. Hey, we've got a mansion over the hilltop. We're joint heirs with Jesus Christ. Our sins are forgiven. We're going to spend eternity with our loved ones who are saved. Do we really have it that bad? No, part of the problem is we love this world too much. I want you to see that in this case, it was God's will. 
to answer this woman's prayer. She's desperate. And she's not deterred by a no. She's not deterred by Jesus ignoring her. She's not deterred by the disciples being irritated with her. She's not deterred by a seeming insult. She keeps worshiping and praying and seeking his face even after he said it's not meat to take the children's bread and to cast it to dogs. What did she say? Verse 27, she prevailed in prayer and she said, truth, Lord. That wouldn't be right. Take the kids' food and throw it to the dogs. Truth, Lord. Yet the dogs eat of the crumbs which fall from their master's table. You know what she's saying? Lord, I may be just a dog. But I want to be yours and I need your help and I need you to answer. She wasn't deterred. Again, many would stop here in pride. If God's not going to answer how I want to, I'm done. No, she stayed humble. Can I tell you, humility is the way to God's grace? It is. Look, look let, let me say it a little differently. God is gracious no matter what. But that being said, God does show special favor to those who humble themselves before him. All through the Bible, you'll find, it doesn't matter who it is, those who humbled themselves before God, God always responds favorably. And those who walk in pride, God always abases. She prevailed in faith. I, I like Psalm 40. It says, I waited patiently for the Lord. That's hard to do, isn't it? Lord, answer! We're, we're used to a microwave. Boop, boop, boop. Er, it's done. God, here's my prayer. I want it done right now. Name it and claim it. Drive through God. God, here's my order. Now give it to me. People get mad if their order is more than three or four minutes at drive through. We expect that from God. God's on his own timetable. I waited patiently for the Lord, and he inclined unto me and heard my cry. He brought me up also out of an horrible pit, out of the miry clay, and set my feet upon a rock and established my goings. And he hath put a new song in my mouth, even praise unto our God. Many shall see it in fear and shall trust in the Lord. Blessed is the man that maketh the Lord his trust and respecteth not the proud, nor such as turn aside to lies. Many, O Lord my God, are thy wonderful words works which thou hast done, and thy thoughts which are to usward, they cannot be reckoned up in order unto thee. If I would declare and speak of them, they are more than can be numbered. You know what he's saying? God delivered me in this case, but even if he didn't, he's been so good to me. Folks, if you're saved, God's been so good to you. If you're not saved, he's still been good to you, and the goodness of God leadeth you to repentance. I want you to see, last of all, the product of her faith. Then Jesus answered and said unto her, verse 20, 28, O woman, great is thy faith. You know who her faith was in? It was in Jesus Christ. O woman, great is thy faith. Be it unto thee, even as thou wilt. And her daughter was made whole from that very hour. It was Jesus' will to heal her daughter. I want to finish one, one more story. Go to Luke 18. I'm going to read this in a couple of minutes and be done. This woman did not give up. When she was ignored, she didn't quit praying. When she was irritating the disciples, she didn't quit praying. When she was flat out denied, she didn't quit praying. Why? She believed this was God's will and she kept praying. She worshiped and pleaded with him again. And even when Jesus tested her faith, she kept praying, worshiping. I want you to see this example will be done here. Luke 18, 1 through 8. He, Jesus, spake a parable. Unto them to this end or for this purpose, that men ought always to pray and not to faint. Do you notice those are the two options, Christian? Those are the two options. You're in a place of despair, you're in a valley, you're in a storm, you have two options. Number one is to pray, to keep bringing it before God, casting all your care upon Him, for He careth for you. Being careful for nothing but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, letting your request be made known unto God. And the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. That's your first option, is to pray. Your second option is to faint, to quit, to give up. How many of you know that quitting something you shouldn't quit never solves the problem? It just makes it worse. Just gives you another problem to deal with. Never solves it. 
God, you, can, you make my life easy and I'll stay faithful. How about you stay faithful when your life's hard? Amen. How about you be like Joseph who, yeah, God was with him in the palace, but he was also with him in the pit and in the prison. And he just served faithfully. Left it up to God. Here, Jesus speaks a parable to teach us that we either pray or we faint. And we ought to pray. We ought, ought always to pray and not to faint. Verse 2. Saying, there was in a city a judge which feared not God, neither regarded man. And there was a widow in that city, and she came unto him, saying, Avenge me of my adversary. And he would not for a while. But afterward he said within himself, Though I fear not God, and regard not, no, nor regard man, yet because this widow troubleth me, I will avenge her. Lest by her continual coming she weary me. And the Lord said, Hear what the unjust judge saith, and shall not God avenge his own elect, which cry day and night unto him, though he bear long with them? I tell you that he will avenge them speedily. Don't miss this. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man cometh, shall he find faith on the earth? Will he find people that even when things aren't going their way are still looking to the Lord, trusting him, serving him, being faithful? Because he is faithful. You're in a place of desperate need. I want to tell you, don't give up. You keep coming to God. Don't quit on God. You keep doing what you know is right, even when things are hard, especially when things are hard. You know, when you're in a storm, that's not the time to get out of the boat. When you're in a storm, that's the time to get closer to the captain. That's Jesus. Let's bow our heads together, please. Have you ever been in a desperate place? Can I encourage you to follow this example? This woman stayed humble. She persevered in prayer. She kept worshiping. God answered. Job, Paul, they persevered in prayer. God told them no. But they still said, His grace is sufficient for me. Though he slay me, yet will I trust in him. But I will maintain mine own ways before him. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. Who would say, Pastor, I am born again. I am a child of God. And I want to thank Jesus Christ for saving my soul. If that's you, would you lift your hand? I know I'm saved. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. Christian, that means you'll never see hell. That means you're going to heaven. That means you're a joint heir with Jesus Christ. Your sins are forgiven. In his Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, he would have told you. He goes to prepare a place for you. And if he said, if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself. That where I am, there ye may be also. Christian, we really have it made. Oh, I know there are struggles, there are tribulations, tests in this life. I know that. I'm not making light of it. I'm simply telling you this is all temporary. Would you just stay faithful, child of God, because your God is faithful? Next time you feel like it's too much, would you look at Jesus taking your cross, my cross, all the way to Calvary, bearing our sins upon his back? Would you think how he went all the way for us? Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. Who would say, Pastor, the truth is I'm not sure I'm saved. If I were to die today, I don't know I'd go to heaven. Please pray for me. If that's you, lift your hand right now until I see it. That's me, Pastor. I don't know I'm saved. I don't know that I'm saved. If I were to die today, I'm not 100% sure I'd go to heaven. Lift your hand until I see it. Anyone at all? Lift it up. I see the little one's hand. Anyone else? Anyone else? Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. Christian, we need a revival, we do, of Christians who, when they'll go through a difficult time, will stay faithful to the Lord. Well, I rejoice to see Christians in our own church persevering for the Lord through difficulty, through trouble, through tribulation. Can I encourage you when you're in that desperate place? Keep your faith in Jesus. When you're in that desperate place, when you're the storm, don't jump out of the boat. Get closer to the captain. Keep bringing your needs to Christ in prayer. Keep bringing your needs to the Lord. Seems like he's not answering. Keep bringing it to the Lord. You believe something God's will. You can look in God's word and know something's God's will. Don't give up praying. Two choices, pray or quit. Don't quit. Don't quit what you shouldn't quit. Keep praying. Bring it to the Lord. Heavenly Father, bless your word to our hearts. I don't know how you've spoken to each heart, but you do. And So I pray that we'll yield to you whatever you've shown to us. 
Thank you that we can cast all our care upon you for you care for us. Help us to remember the things we've heard today. In Jesus' name. Let's stand to our feet.